Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for turning out again early on a Friday morning on a nice crisp fall day, or a nice marginally crisp fall day, which is, I think, as good as we're going to get right now, um, to the second of our monthly seminar events. Uh, I'm Julie Fisher. I'm the co-director of the Center for Global Health Science and Security here at Georgetown with Rebecca Katz, who is at this moment, we hope, on an airplane on her way from San Francisco where she was delayed by smoke. So uh, conveys her apologies at being late and we hope will be able to join us here sometime before the end. But that leaves me the pleasure of introducing Ambassador Jimmy Coker as our speaker. So um, Ambassador Coker has recently retired as the Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs at the US Department of Health and Human Services. The Office of Global Affairs in the Office of the Secretary leads the department's efforts to better the health and well-being of Americans and of the world's population through global strategies and partnerships and works with other US government agencies in the coordination of global health policy. So. Uh, in easy terms, Ambassador Kolker was our senior global health diplomat for the U.S., and he led the agency, HHS, through several major health emergencies. Prior to that, Ambassador Kolker served as a principal deputy assistant secretary for the office, and prior to joining HHS, Ambassador Kolker was the chief of the HIV and AIDS section at UNICEF's New York headquarters um, from 2007 to 2011. And he has had a 30-year diplomatic career with the State Department, where he served as the Deputy Global AIDS Coordinator in the Office of the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator from 2005 to 2007, after serving as U.S. Ambassador to Uganda and Burkina Faso. He was Deputy Chief of Mission at U.S. Embassies in Denmark and Botswana and had previous postings in the U.K., Sweden, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. And we're also delighted to say that Ambassador Kolker is an affiliate of our center, and we are excited to have him here today as an affiliate of our center and to share his experiences with global health diplomacy, and particularly his experiences during the Zika and Ebola outbreaks. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Coulter. Thanks, Julian. Thanks to all of you to, for being here at an early hour. It's a real privilege for me to be here. I'm not an academic, and I am thrilled to be associated now with Georgetown in my retirement since January. And also somewhat uh, sobered that there are some U.S. government colleagues, former colleagues, who are here to correct the record when I go off base or say something that uh, needs further clarification. Um, but it's a treat for me especially to talk to students and the, be in the School of Foreign Service here because one of the things that I want to emphasize during the course of this talk is I had the challenge of how do you prepare for a job that doesn't exist yet. When I graduated from college many, many years ago, not only had no one ever heard of AIDS, but um, there was the idea that there were health diplomats really was not something that anyone had on their agenda. And it, I hope that as we have discussions here that those of you who are preparing for careers either in foreign service and diplomacy or in global health will realize the overlap between those two and to to realize also that uh, 15 or 30 years from now, there are going to be careers which you will be part of, which there's no way to imagine or prepare for at the moment. And that's what's exciting, I think, about being a student today. I was in the Foreign Service for 30 years. I had five posts in Africa and three in Europe. And I ended up as ambassador to Uganda when the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief was announced, the PEPFAR program. And Uganda was to be its showpiece. And um, one of the things that I've learned, especially since joining HHS, but certainly the PEPFAR response was a good introduction, is that there are two cultures, that scientists see a problem and gather data and evidence, and if the evidence is strong enough, they publish something in a peer-reviewed journal and they've solved the problem. I think for a diplomat, that's the beginning of the beginning of the solution to the problem. And the question is, how do we use that data and evidence and the facts that we know are established to put our priorities onto someone else's agenda. And in the PEPFAR case, this was how to scale up something that science told us would work, but that we didn't, to do it in a place where it had never been tested. And the skills of a diplomat to determine 
which existing programs to continue, legacy AIDS programs already U.S. government in Uganda, which U.S. government agency had a comparative advantage in different parts of the PEPFAR response, and which local partners or U.S. contract partners would be the right match for what we were trying to accomplish. And I think those of you who know about PEPFAR now, it's a huge success. It's named after the Marshall Plan as the great example of what America stands for in the world. But 14 years ago, this was by no means a foregone conclusion. It's a very controversial program, and we really didn't know what we were doing. Certainly, the diplomats who were, I think because they didn't know better, they assigned responsibility for PEPFAR to ambassadors and country teams. Watch out what you wish for. As a diplomat, I said that's exactly how we could get the best results. But it was really um, an outlier in terms of how we approach development aid or health cooperation with other countries. And so the question of how to manage a program which was charting new territory and where we had a huge number of stakeholders and a lot of moving parts was um, something that changed my life. And PEPFAR changed thousands of people's lives. But mine was certainly one of them. And, but probably being in the Foreign Service building here, not many of you think of uh, health and human services as your career track. But my last five years were at HHS. And I'd like to put in a plug uh, as well. And you'll see from some of the Ebola examples how central HHS is to, to global health diplomacy. But uh, HHS is a huge global actor. There are 500 US staff under chief of mission authority overseas. And there's a 1,500 locally employed staff for HHS. And there's a kind of new paradigm that donor-recipient um, relations is a 20th century concept. The idea that contractors are going to provide basic services in low- and middle-income countries has really been overtaken by the fact that there's a critical mass of good public health people and good program administrators in countries like Uganda. And that when PEPFAR started, our eight leading partners all had expatriates as the program managers and heads of the operation. I went back eight years later, and every single one of them had a Ugandan in that position. That's sustainability, but that's also just a sign that in programs like yours, there are now people who do not require transportation, housing allowances, school fees, and other things to get jobs with um, implementing agencies overseas. And that's a good thing, but it's not necessarily a good thing if you're in the labor market here and looking for contractor jobs. But that donor-recipient uh, paradigm has been replaced by, it seems to me, a technical partnerships where what low- and middle-income countries want from the US, even the poorest countries, is can you send us your best experts to build capacity in our system so that we can have first world surveillance and response, for instance, to health emergencies? And HHS has a comparative advantage in this in that um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Institutes of Health, Food and Drug Administration, even HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration, which I admit I'd never heard of before I came to HHS, but is a huge um, provider of AIDS care here, the Ryan White Care Act, and uh, uh, help to vulnerable populations through community health centers and other things. But all of those people have on staff already the world's best experts in the areas that we're talking about. And the HHS thinking, its systems, its culture don't reflect this at all. None of these people is hired because they have a global responsibility or because they're seen as someone who could be the best US representative in the event of an outbreak or whatever overseas. So and even, even more, our global health partners, especially the World Health Organization, are 20th century institutions. They're member state institutions, and they're made up of technical people who are separate from the sense that this is an expeditionary force or that we're talking about a world of health diplomacy. And early in 2014, uh, in the forests of Guinea, the Ebola outbreak began. It spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone. And you know, the, many people responded, the pathogen is a pathogen, an outbreak is an outbreak. We know how to deal with these things. But there are a lot of things that, as a policy person and a diplomat, um, you realize became very important in the response, which sometimes the technical people didn't have in their context. First of all, in all three countries, the forest regions were opposition strongholds. These were areas that had been neglected by the central government and very resentful of government. And 
their poor communication to the capital was a problem, and with the later exception of Monrovia, the capital cities were not really affected. And so the ministries of health, which were in poor shape to begin with, certainly the rural network was uh, not particularly functional, but they sent some additional MDs to the affected areas. And they were required then, once they admitted that it was Ebola and, and were able to diagnose it, to report to the World Health Organization that there had been an outbreak. And this is done through WHO representatives in each capital. These are people who are uh, WHO employees, but embedded in ministries of health. And in, the, in many cases, and it was true in all three of the Ebola-affected countries, the World Health Organization representatives for the country were patronage jobs. These were jobs given to people who had supported the regional director in his re-election bid. And the ministers of health themselves, who are the ones who vote for the regional director, um, are the target audience. And so the goal was to please the minister of health and to be not uh, do anything that would alarm the, the host government. Even though this is supposed to be the leading voice for public health in the country, in none of the cases were what was reported to the regional office in Brazzaville particularly alarmist or, or probably accurate in, in the full extent of the problem. But the WHO, in, and it's interesting that the regional office for WHO is in Brazzaville, when you think about being a 20th century organization, it was put there in 1948 because that was the capital of French Equatorial Africa and had been the home of the free French. So Brazzaville deserved a reward for their role in World War II. And suddenly, if you're thinking of 2014 or 2015, Brazzaville is not the, it's kind of at the end of the food chain for information and communication with the rest of the world, even with the rest of Africa. And so it's not surprising that their reaction also was understated. They sent some Senegalese and Nigerian doctors who did heroic work, but the whole point of WHO at the time was to work through local systems and ministries of health. And those uh, ministries of health were disintegrating because of, especially in the areas where Ebola was killing the health workers. And many of these doctors who were sent from a list, and they had a call-up list for WHO, sadly lost their lives because the facilities were not suitable for treating Ebola patients. And WHO Afro office was then required to inform Geneva about what was going on. But there's, there really was a question which I think we all have to think about, which is, real versus perceived risk. In Guinea, Ebola, even once Ebola was underway and, and was um, recognized as a major outbreak, it was the 18th leading cause of death in Guinea. There were more women dying in childbirth than there were people dying of Ebola in, in 2014 in Guinea. And the outbreaks unit in Geneva was horribly understaffed. They did not have the right people to respond to a, a health-led emergency. They'd had big cuts in their budget to finance the emerging issue of non-communicable diseases, which WHO had taken some responsibility for. And they also had a roster of doctors. They sent those doctors. Again, they were involved in the Ministry of Health system in, in public clinics, which turned out not to be functional. Many of them had been abandoned by their staff. But again, the heroic people I have a huge admiration for. But I think most crucially, the in the initial reports of Ebola, the outbreaks people in Geneva did not involve the emergencies people. Emergencies were mostly to lead the health part of a response to a natural disaster. And so it, this was not a natural disaster. And in fact, one, the key thing that made this different from what international response and the UN system tended to respond to is that the people we were trying to help were the threat. There's a hurricane or a volcano eruption or an earthquake, um, the event happens, there might be risks of aftershocks, but essentially it's over and the people you're trying to help are there to be helped and are not themselves a threat. And the central system outside of the area of the um, particular catastrophe is pretty much intact. This was much different. The people that we were trying to help were in fact the threat and the global emergency response system just was not set up for this. It, so the people who actually were in the field in the Ebola-affected countries were uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the MSF, Doctors Without Borders, who alerted the CDC. CDC has presence in 60 countries 
around the world, but uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea were not three of them. And they um, were, they are really the world's leaders in surveillance of figuring out what's happening, who's affected, who's at risk here. And they weren't there, and there were, that function was not being performed. And in addition, because these were opposition areas, there was huge domestic opposition. In Guinea, the people in the area accused the government of genocide, that they weren't responding. That West Point, this uh, very heavily populated area of Monrovia, actually had demonstrations that the government was, uh, was not treating Ebola cases uh, properly. And the government did what, the absolutely stupidest thing, which was to quarantine the whole area of West Point so that the people couldn't reach appropriate facilities, even if they tried. And um, so, but in the meantime, partly because we had terrific ambassadors in Liberia and Guinea, Debbie Malik and Alex Lascaris, respectively, Alex is a Georgetown alum, and um, they were, they did get CDC people into the country in June and July of um, 2014, and there at least was some sense of being able to estimate the, the extent of the problem. The situation in Sierra Leone was different. Not only was the government opposition tension more prolonged than in the other places and they didn't get a grip on it, but um, they simply were sure that they could handle this problem and didn't want the attention of the outside world coming to say that they couldn't handle the problem. And we had on our staff at HHS a wonderful doctor named Austin Denby who actually, the diagnostic he developed for Lassa fever is still, when he was the head of a lab in Kenema, Sierra Leone, Kenema was the epicenter of where they were trying to treat Ebola patients. Perfect person to send there, except that it turns out that because Kenema was in the opposition stronghold, Austin's cousins were opposition politicians. He went there for three weeks in July, was unable to see the president, barely saw the Minister of Health, was not able to get them to approve CDC. He's a CDC employer, was that time. And um, so uh, Sierra Leone essentially did not have outside assistance um, except for these doctors who were dying in the, in the labs um, in, at that time. And the fact that we had no ambassador, I don't know if you remember at that time, it seems almost trivial in today's world, but there was a big hold by the Republican Congress on ambassadorial nominees in 2014. And Sierra Leone was one of those that had not had an ambassador for a long time. Chargé there, uh, Kathleen, um, Fitzpatrick did a great job, but it's not the same as when you have an ambassador to get to see the president. And it was only in August when we sent Austin back in the circumstances that I'll talk about that they finally agreed to have anyone from CDC actually resident in the country. By the end of July, Tom Frieden made a visit to the region and was just horrified. And this was uh, also highlighted by the case in Nigeria in which a gentleman named Sawyer arrived at the Lagos airport very sick and quickly died. And the sense that this, that Ebola might spread to Lagos, probably the most difficult city in Africa in which to control an outbreak like that, and that, um, we were, that the cases were turning up, it appeared everywhere, um, caused lots of alarm. It certainly got people's attention. I was asked, it was, but not WHO's, and it was, um, I remember being asked at the end of July of 2014 to call Margaret Chan, the Director General of WHO, and said, you know, we're really taking this seriously, and Tom Frieden was just there, and this is going to, the problem is already skyrocketing, and we haven't heard very much from WHO on that issue. And she said, yeah, I've just decided to cancel my August 1st vacation, and we're going to take a look at all this. But there, and, but there was not a sense that all hell was breaking loose. But indeed it was. And on August 2nd, you'll remember Kent Brantley, the missionary in Monrovia, was medevaced to Atlanta. And the Doctors Without Borders was calling for the US military to intervene, saying they thought they were the only ones with the capacity to actually stem the epidemic. And this is so countercultural for MSF to be interested in military involvement or solutions at all and resulted in the famous tweet from then private citizen Donald Trump saying that Kent Brantley knew the risks when he went to Liberia and we, he should, no one with Ebola should be medevaced to the United States. This, he should be able to 
uh, anticipate the consequences of his decisions. But in fact, the science here is important because there are 150 people a day arriving in the United States from the three affected countries, just a normal uh, tourist and business uh, family travel. And the risk to healthcare workers versus the risk to the general public was not realized. And one of the mantras that Tom Frieden had was that we inevitably underestimate the risk to healthcare workers and overestimate the risk to the general public. And, but the, the sense that the people we were trying to help were also the threat meant that some of our mobilizations were um, hard to adapt to the situation. The first one CDC did send, they mobilized remarkably and sent dozens of people that month and hundreds over the course of the epidemic. But um, they, those people were not providing care. They were doing surveillance and uh, protocols, operation centers, other things which were vitally important. But still, the Tom Frieden talked about the hockey stick curve that was good, of the number of cases going up, a real threat. And USAID Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, which is a wonderful office and did, did and does terrific work, um, did their usual thing. They put out a request for proposals, and after the Haiti earthquake, they apparently got 1,000 in the first two weeks. It, for Ebola, they got zero. No one was willing to actually, they didn't have, the NGOs didn't have people on the ground. They were scared to go in. It was very clear that many doctors and healthcare workers had died, and there simply weren't treatment centers to staff. And so this system collapse um, was an important factor in the WHO finally on August 6th and 7th convening their emergency committee and declaring Ebola in West Africa a public health emergency of international concern. And this set up a couple really key interventions, which were the airport checks in West Africa and in the United States and other developed countries, and restrictions on the ports of entry that people coming from those countries could could use. So, and CDC by that time had a grip on the problem that the underlying problems were burial practices in particular, because the, apparently the pathogen is even more virulent in a corpse than uh, in a live body, and that the practices of touching the deceased uh, relative and, in fact, sometimes embracing them, wa washing, ritual washing of the bodies was the most dangerous possible activity, but also home care. And the, the sense that these people weren't being put into isolation was a, a key factor. So again, understanding the science was crucial to trying to get things on the right track. But this resulted in a certain amount of interagency chaos in Washington. And there are a couple of people in the room who probably were part of that. Um, they, Tom Frieden finally got to see President Obama, who had earlier, when he first briefed him about his trip in July, President said, sadly, this is a, shouldn't the European Union be handling this? This is so much closer to Europe than to the United States, and did not mobilize non-health, non-aid resources at the time. But it became so obvious that the logistical capacity to set up treatment centers and to bring the uh, kinds of equipment that would be needed to deal with what was seen as an outbreak, which could have affected potentially millions of people, only the U.S. military was required. And, and this was a fascinating interagency process in which the military insisted essentially on an exit strategy before they had an entry strategy and insisted, contrary to science and to the practice we were recommending for civilians, to quarantine anyone who had been in Liberia, even though they had made sure that they would have no chance of contacting anyone who might be infected with Ebola. Um, that they quarantined all the military who were delivering these supplies to the Monrovia airport for two weeks in Italy after their, um, uh, after their trips to West Africa. And this, of course, was a further disincentive for health workers to come if they were going to be quarantined if they were going in and out of the country. And the US was very close to establishing a travel ban. I remember being in those discussions where, again, this trying to bring the evidence of the 150 people a day who had been coming for six months and no one had been infected. And the sense that this was exactly what would prolong the epidemic because health workers would be uh, almost uh, impossible to recruit if they could never get back to the United States or if their travel was, was banned. 
and that the airport system seemed to be working. So it's a great example of where we ultimately prevailed that risk management was a better public policy tool than risk avoidance in this circumstance. That if you didn't, if you avoided all risks, you were never going to deal with the problem and these risks could be managed even though we didn't know exactly how. And indeed, the, you know, there were only, if you were living in the United States in 2014, 2015, you were eight times more likely to be a Republican candidate for president of the United States than you were to contract Ebola. <laughs> and the, there were only, I mean, literally only, there were only health workers, some coming from Africa, only two who contracted Ebola in the United States. And so we, we made the right decision on the uh, travel restrictions, but it was, a, it was a tough call. And then the military did deliver couple dozen treatment centers only to the Monrovia airport. It was somebody else's responsibility to get them out to the provinces and the counties. It was somebody else's responsibility to staff them. And while MSF really deserves all the credit and praise that they, they have, I think, for the great job of being in the field when no one else was, I do want to also give a shout out to International, um, what's called IMC, International Medical Corps, that um, responded to the once the treatment centers were there, they responded first and most um, enthusiastically, I guess, or most uh, aggressively to the USAID request for people to staff the centers. And I, um, at the same time, we had been telling the military since July that meetings I went to, which where there were a lot of international partners, about Ebola said, the U.S., Britain, and France have to be establishing first world level care in the capitals for health workers to get the health workers back into the field and realizing that people like Kent Brantley were able to survive and there were some experimental medicines and other things. So we spent two fruitless weeks trying to describe for the military the field hospital that we thought would be good or CDC thought would be good in uh, Monrovia when it after enormous uh, lists of not hardware but uh, capacity that was needed, they said, well, the military said, well, we really only have one kind of field hospital. So they delivered the only field hospital they had, which of course had a dental unit and obstetric unit, other things completely irrelevant to the Ebola response. But it was a facility and it worked and they were willing to stay long enough to show other people how to operate it. The question is, who were those other people? And so the Within HHS, we have the uh, Public Health Service, the Commission Corps, which has 6,000 members um, and is a uniformed service which is deployable. And every, sort of everyone said, well, we have to deploy the Public Health Service. But there was no precedent for them being deployed at this scale to actually run a whole facility in a country where they had no familiarity, they had no protocols for doing so. Every one of these 6,000 had another job, often absolutely crucial in the prison service, the Indian Health Service, very difficult to replace them in, in those places. They also said, well, we're a uniform service, we're going to be under military command, right? Well, no, you're going to be under chief of mission authority. Well, what's chief of mission authority? What does this mean? Who's going to provide the Ebola training? Who's going to, where are we going to live? Who's going to provide security for this facility and for us outside the facility, having known that there were health workers actually mobbed by crowds? The place that they identified was in a floodplain. There was no potable water. These people did not have license to practice medicine in Liberia. They couldn't prescribe drugs. And maybe the toughest question of all is, who's a health worker? This is a facility for health workers. OK, so health, some health workers, we have a picture in our mind's eye. We know who they are. But is the cleaner of the health facility in a rural area a health worker? Well, yeah, he, he or she is suffering a lot of risk. So that person has to be included. What about the person who does the budget for the NGO in the capital city? Nah, we didn't think that was a health worker. What about the CNN reporter who's an American citizen who shows up at the door of your facility with a camera running saying, I think I've been exposed to Ebola. Are you going to turn that person away? Said, probably not. You're probably going to try to give that person care. And the question of who would then keep out the people that supposedly didn't qualify, who would make these exceptions for high profile cases that we would be faced, there's no one in the US government that does these things. And we did have to develop a capacity, and I'm proud to say in my office did it with two great guys, Michael Schmoyer and Mitchell Wolf, who were in the Commission Corps, 
who systematically, with the embassy in Monrovia, with the Commission Corps, checked every one of those boxes of how are you going to deploy people. And, and the Commission Corps was remarkable. This was at a time, Labor Day weekend, when Tom Frieden was estimating on TV that a million people could be affected by Ebola, and this was out of control. And they sent out a mailing on the Friday before Labor Day, and by Tuesday afterwards, a thousand people had volunteered to go to Liberia. So this was a motivated force, but they had all the boxes in their matrix of are we ready to go were red. No, no, nothing was in place. And so getting this going, in, it turned out to be two months. We hoped it would be less. And of course, it was a game changer, but it was a game changer in part because the Liberians themselves responded, knowing there's at least the possibility of the health workers being taken care of and that the Yanks were coming, the Americans were there, military. Um, I was only in West Africa in February of 2015 to help negotiate the retransfer of this uh, oddly placed medical facility back to the Liberians. Um, but everyone said to the U.S. Embassy and the Liberians themselves that that announcement that the U.S. was bringing the military supplies was the game changer. People started washing their hands. They gave the elbow handshakes. It was a, it was a great um, kind of psychological uh, boost. And Liberia indeed was the first of the countries to bend that curve in, in the right direction. And the British, in a similar situation where they did not have a commission corps and had saved the children initially, tried to staff their medical center, never were able to open it until the British military actually came after the first of the year when could, largely the epidemic was under control. And the French had a much more modest facility in Guinea. And it was my job at a couple of the interagency meetings to say, you know, the French and Guineans hate each other, and they have since 1958. And Guinea was the country that voted against staying in France, and they have never had a good relationship. And the sense in Guinea that the, the, the main source of income for the people in the most affected areas of Guinea is smuggling. And the question that the health authorities, of course, had to ask, who, you know, who have you met during the past two weeks and what kind of contact did you have with them? And no one told the truth. I mean, they, they, this, they were in the habit of simply ignoring any questions from the government and being, in fact, actively opposed to any sort of uh, inquisition like that. And it, made, it, it did make the challenge immensely harder in Guinea. And it's not perhaps a surprise that Guinea was the last place to bring the epidemic under control, even though the number of deaths there was, was fewer than in other countries. Stepping back for one minute, there, it turns out we, to how could we prevent this from happening again and what's the role of a health diplomat in that? And it turns out, and I gather your first speaker here was Beth Cameron, that the um, initiative on which she worked full time for a long time, Global Health Security Agenda, was the answer. And we already had it in place. It had been developed before we knew Ebola was a problem. And it is the whether there's a naturally occurring pathogen like Ebola or a lab accident, which we've unfortunately experienced some of, or an intentional release of a pathogen like uh, by a bioterrorist, it's the health system that needs to respond to figure out what, what the threat is, how it's spreading, who's affected, who's at risk. And the, there had been a history of the people most um, eager to deal with that problem within the US government were the US military. And it was a force protection issue, and it was seen as a bio threat response. And the many in the health community said, well, you're just securitizing health. And indeed, the priorities of where the military intervened were highlighted, and which were not necessarily the goals of the health system, were um, in Georgia, where if you remember, right before the 2008 election, the Russians occupied two provinces of of the Republic of Georgia, and President Bush promised a billion dollars. It turns out that about 30% of that money went to establish a beautiful facility called the Lugar Center, named after the senator who was largely responsible for getting them the billion dollars, um, which was going to be a regional reference lab and a state-of-the-art medical facility in Georgia, and it was built. They had, the military had not, at that point, informed the Ministry of Health of Georgia, nor the CDC, nor any of the other US government stakeholders in global health, and went ahead and built a $300 million facility in a place that would not have been anyone's first priority for that kind of facility. 
And I think it was that moment, and it, I should say all of this was worked out. There now are CDC people resident there. There are U.S. military people there. Georgians love it. The Azerbaijanis and Armenians are both there, even though they don't talk to each other in other circumstances. So, so it, it, it turned out to be not a bad investment. But the, and the people from Abkhazia and South Ossetia can come there for certain tests that are not available in their home areas, which is a huge political plus for the, the government of Georgia. Um, but be that as it may, the initiative was how, from our point of view in HHS, how are we going to health, how are we going to healthify security? How can we get this money, the initiative, the very necessary measures that the military had up to then been leading for um, health security and look at health priorities and outbreaks as what's the most likely to cause us the trillions of dollars of lost time and economic uh, activity over the next few years. And the, the um, international health regulations were the other answer. They were already in place. They'd been passed in 2005. Only a tiny minority of countries had actually fulfilled them. But these are WHO requirements for countries to um, put in place uh, 19 different uh, systems that would reduce the risk of bioterrorist attack, but also establish some norms for outbreaks and, and dealing with the epidemics. And so this, these, that combination of having the international health regulations, WHO is responsible, global health security agenda, which we and WHO co-convened, was a sort of coalition of the willing, was actually enormously timely and helpful in saying how are we going to present, prevent these outbreaks from happening again. And in the kind of aftermath of Ebola, there were five blue ribbon panels all set up to say what went wrong. And all of them found WHO very deficient. But all of them also came to the conclusion that there really was no alternative, that WHO was the worst possible response except all the others that they could imagine thinking of. And so, and the US sort of bought into this even before these studies were around and decided that the baby was about to go out with the bathwater in WHO if we didn't intervene to try to make it the organization we had needed in the Ebola response. And that, uh, I was pleased to say that our mission in Geneva were the ones who were really driving this, but they recruited me for the famous 45 hours of negotiations for the resolution that told WHO, the member states telling WHO, this is what you need to do to reform, to be relevant. This is January uh, 2015 to the Ebola epidemic and the remaining response that's needed, but also to reorganize yourself to be effective in, in responding to emergencies. And that kind of multilateral activity, again, realizing that the US government can't be the world's 911 for this, and that WHO should have the capacity to do this. This is the logical place this should happen. But what do we need to do with an organization that has a b budget of $2 billion a year? UNICEF, where I work, has $4 billion a year. PEPFAR has $6 billion a year. So WHO has a mandate much broader than those others, but for which they're absolutely unprepared to, to assume all the responsibilities that we're giving them. But internal reforms were absolutely necessary. The relation of the country, regional and Geneva offices, the integration of the outbreak and emergency units there, sense that the director general needs to be informed in real time when there are threats like this. All of that, in fact, has taken place, not as fast as it should have, maybe with some uh, overhang of its traditions. But that, I think, is a real accomplishment we can look at of having used the bad experience of Ebola to actually help WHO be the organization we need it to be. And that was evident. I think even in the, a year later when Zika um, broke out in Brazil. And so many things were different, the, starting with the, the WHO regional office based in Washington, the radiator building that you all see near here, is um, an American health organization, is in fact good. And they were in touch, the Brazilians were in touch immediately with PAHO, reported the information accurately. Brazil has a tremendous network of parastatal uh, public health organizations, the Fio Cruz, the Chagas Institution, Butantan, which does uh, vaccinations. And the CDC had a presence in Brazil. We have, from HHS, it's one of the six countries where we have a health attache who was very much on top of this and reporting things back from a health point of view, but also embedded in the embassy. 
and a wonderful ambassador, Lillian Ayalde, who was a USAID career officer. And the advantage of having someone who actually had global health as one of her um, skill set was enormously helpful, for instance, when the question of uh, should the US participate in the Olympics came up. And the risk to athletes or to spectators was, in fact, pretty minuscule. But you can imagine, and you remember the debate, there were very strong voices calling us on us to boycott the Olympics. And the fact that not a single person, athlete or spectator, actually was, as far as we know, affected by Zika during the Olympic Games. In retrospect, well, that was an easy decision, but it absolutely was not at the time. And having that network of competent Brazilians, competent regional health organization, and the US presence uh, on the scene were, were really important. But in February 1st, 2016, the then president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, called President Obama and said in a kind of typical Brazilian way, we've done everything right, it's brilliant, our response has been, um, our response has been first class, but would you mind just sending the world's leading experts to Brazil to just kind of double check that we're on the right track, that, that everything we've done is right? And again, a, a perfect example of where countries don't need our aid, they need actually our expertise and to have counterparts that they can rely on who are the world's best experts. And I had the honor of actually trying to assemble this team, and this got passed, of course, from Obama immediately to a lot of other people, Secretary Burwell, and finally down to me. But just only two weeks later, February 17th, we were there with the deputy head of CDC, uh, the head of the Eunice Shriver National Institute of Child Health, with uh, someone from the, Tony Fauci's deputy at National Institute of uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the FDA, and the BARDA, the Biomedical Authority, right, Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, um, and who do vaccines for us again. I didn't know about this place until I got to HHS. Um, and the first day was, as we kind of anticipated, the Brazilians all saying how they've done everything perfectly in a series of non-discussed presentations by them. And so overnight, I got with my Brazilian counterpart from the Ministry of Health, and their Minister of Health was co-chair of this group with me. I said, you know, we're, we've got some problems. You're not sharing samples. You're not letting CDC do their cohort studies. You're not giving visas to people who want to come in here and, and work with you. We've got the best people here. Let's figure out a way that we can let the technical people do their jobs. And so we developed overnight a matrix of 14 different intervention areas. And by each of them, there was a list of the task, but also which parastatal institution in Brazil was responsible and which US government uh, agency was. And that, uh, the next day was spent negotiating this matrix. And as the Brazilian government disintegrated over the next three, four months, this matrix actually stood the test of time. And the Zika cooperation went essentially uninterrupted. And it's a good example of the opposite of Ebola, whereas Ebola, you needed a sort of policy and diplomatic judgment at every stage of this. The epidemic itself was, was not going to be containable unless you got a huge multi-sectoral response. Zika was a great example of the opposite, of where you could a diplomat could be a kind of a, um, someone who brought someone together or who uh, redirected the discussion when it was going in a way that was too technical. But at the same time, it was only the technical people were perfectly competent to solve most of these problems and to get the Ministry of Health and our government more or less out of the way so that these technical people could get on with it turned out to be the right solution. And so I'm, I'm, uh, that's uh, it's a long story about Ebola, a short one about Zika, but those are some of the lessons I learned from that experience. And I'd love to hear your questions and comments, sir. I've gone on so long. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I wish it had been more. I would talk to you. <laughs> no, no, it was a wonderful description. And thank you very much for those insights into yeah. what was happening behind the scenes while the, the news headlines were, were telling us what was happening um, in large, loud letters. Yeah. Um, so I think that I would like to take the prerogative of the um, default chair and ask the first question and then open it to the floor. Um, I'm supposed to stand behind this. Yeah, yes, you have to stand. Sorry, you can stroll around, but then you have to speak at that. So okay. it's kind of <laughs> One of the things you've 
in the, the longer story about Ebola that you have really highlighted is, is coming down to the end, what happens as the, the epidemic curves begin to change. And I wonder if you have some thoughts about the way we think both domestically and globally about recovery mm -hmm. from these major um, events, particularly whether, whatever the cause of the outbreak, about what it means to continue that assistance and what we think about when we think about recovery from a major outbreak in terms of our partnerships and sustaining the progress we make. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, first of all, the goal is there are some diseases that have been eradicated, uh, smallpox and probably rinderpest. But, and we're working on polio and um, guinea worm and possibly river blindness, that these are diseases we may not see again, and that would be a good thing. And it's very hard, but we're making progress. What the goal of most of public health, as I learned as a policymaker, is to make these diseases routine or manageable. And having been in Uganda, I noticed that during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, there was an Ebola outbreak in Uganda, and one person died and 14 others were affected but they diagnosed it within 24 hours, they did the contact tracing, they did the surveillance, they did the lab work in real time, and one person dying is regrettable, but it's not 10,000 people dying, and that made a huge difference there. And I think the reason was that in 2000, the previously largest Ebola outbreak in the world was in northern Uganda, and a heroic doctor named Matthew Lukwaya um, died at the very end of that because he had not taken adequate precautions, and I, one of my unfulfilled goals, which I hope you'll pursue in Uganda when you're there, is that the street in front of Parliament in Uganda is named for Siad Barre, the long forgotten dictator of Somalia. And I proposed and um, that they rename that street for Matthew Lequoia. I mean, why not have uh, value something that's really heroic? Didn't succeed. So that's still an unfinished business. But what the legacy of Matthew Lequoia is that CDC at the Uganda Virus Research Institute established a Ugandan-run Ebola center. And it is, in fact, so many of the samples from West Africa were sent there because that was the reference lab for Ebola in the world. And being able to establish those sorts of facilities all around the world, probably not every country needs one. But that is the goal for global health today. And so this, the sense is not that we're going to just need, it would be wonderful if we had cures for these, if we had vaccines, those are we're working on those. I hope you are. And, um, but at the same time, the idea that we're never going to see these diseases again is an idle hope. We are going to see them. And the question is, what, how do you identify the outbreak quickly enough to respond in a way that you're minimizing the damage and using the existing health systems that don't need to be supplemented externally to be able to deal with them? So I guess I don't know if that's your question, but that's where I come down. Jimmy, this is uh, John Monaghan, the Office of the President. So thank you for coming here, and also thank you for your service. Um, it was really it's an amazing career. I, sorry, I missed the beginning. I hope you gave everybody a little bit of a window of what your career has been like. And my question really goes to this. I thought what was fascinating about your description of uh, what happened in Ebola is your the ability to interplay science and public health with the political context, the cultural context. And it seems to me that's a powerful thing for us, to, for the U.S. government to be able to do, both in our science agencies and in the Foreign Service. So I guess any thoughts you have about looking forward, what could we do to better equip our country to be able to make the walk in the two worlds the way you have done so far? No, I mean, the, it, the problem is it's a very, very small pond. There are not very many health diplomats, and the need is enormous, and that's why I because I titled this that uh, Lessons Learned for Health Diplomacy, because we need a lot more people who are trying to think in those terms. And I, I backed into this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I just was at the right or wrong place at, at the right time when PEPFAR started to, to do all this. But um, you, I mean, the people who are here, the interdisciplinary work that you're doing at Georgetown, I think is exactly what needs to be done. And the idea that Foreign Service School and the Public Health School are actually talking to each other and taking each other's courses is absolutely the place to start. And you, you also missed that I, I'm, my goal is to prepare people for jobs that don't exist yet, and there are going to be plenty of those in global health diplomacy. Can you please also introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Julia Peterson. Um, I just started a AAAS fellowship, actually, which is another way to bring science into 
um, and I am being posted at the Department of Defense Health Affairs. Um, I, I, by the way, in addition to being the affiliation here, I am a, I think, this thing scholar, doesn't that sound impressive, at AAAS, um, and working on a science diplomacy curriculum for colleges, which, and I'm writing the first case study, which is about PEPFAR's origin, the second one's going to be on Ebola, so it, it will soon. <laughs> I attended the science diplomacy workshop last spring. So, but anyways, my question was about, um, I am new to government, um, and I have found in my first few weeks that it's very challenging, because I do think that the military system has a lot to offer in terms of interest, infrastructure mm -hmm. and logistics. But translating that into the healthifying of security mm -hmm. for the greater good is challenging. Mm -hmm. Do you have insights on how you do that, how you can redirect some of these amazing resources before the outbreak so that you have some sort of sustainable system in place? Yeah, I guess my experience, including in this field, is that people make a huge difference. The fact that Andy Weber and Lance Brooks from DITRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, saw this and were persuadable that the emphasis of military um, priorities in global health response and force protection and other things that are important, but probably not the number one global health priorities, <laughs> were um, uh, our priorities that where CDC and other health actors really are have a comparative advantage and could contribute to the solution and add value that that uh, needs to be ongoing. But the absolute difference maker, which I should have highlighted, was that in December 2014, the Congress passed an emergency appropriation that gave USAID and CDC a billion dollars for health security. And the fact that that money has not been re-requested, and I think your center is one of the non-beneficiaries of that non-request, um, is um, really crucial. And the idea is we can't just do this once. I mean, you're not going to get the system in place and maintained by investing once and doing this joint external evaluation and saying what the gaps are. And yes, some of them can be met in country and some of them don't cost a lot of money, but many of them do cost a lot of money. And without U.S. leadership in this, it's not going to happen. DOD, I think, mentally prepared to deal with this and to help, but I don't think that they're, even though they're under less budget pressure than everyone else, CDC is running out of money this year. And what they're going to be able to do to fulfill the obligations they've already undertaken, we have people in the, ex in the room nodding, I'm glad the experts agree, is, is a real mystery because there just isn't money coming from anywhere else in the current budget that can sustain these, these um, operations. So um, what you can do is, I think, be an advocate for... <laughs> health security and the, the clear value added of getting the health input into what the DOD is doing and also global health priorities that there's so many institutions working on this that DOD can't just look at NAMRU labs as the end all of their biomedical research and so on. I'm Ambassador. I'm Rebecca Morgan. I'm a State Department Foreign Service Officer also. I'm just over to the Pentagon as a foreign policy advisor and LSU policy. My first tour was in Brazil, and allow me to verify that that's how Brazilians are with everything that they do. <laughs> um, I'm wondering uh, how you see the rule, or how we can better coordinate the efforts of not just the WHO, but all of the organizations that want to have their hands sort of in the health pot of G7 and the Avion, APEC, and then the outside, Bill and Melinda Gates, and the Globe. But there are all these people that want to have their hand in the health pot. And how do we, it seems a little bit disjointed, how can we sort of make a more cohesive effort with these organizations? Sure, I, I think it's inevitably going to be a little bit disjointed, and you've only scratched the surface of the people who are involved. Um, World Bank wants to take some of this over with Jim Kim, and the, there are many key actors. That, and it's going to be a messy landscape. We have not, again, these studies did not, there was one that said, oh, the Secretary General needs to appoint a global health kind of czar, and that didn't happen, and I don't think it's going to happen, and I don't think that others would align themselves with that kind of authority. So it, from my point of view, it is that another reason that U.S. leadership is essential, and I mean, it's, 
great that Secretary Tillerson has got three or four things he's dealing with and maybe he's on the right side of and they're interesting to the president, but the 950 other priorities of US global leadership are not being delegated to anyone or addressed. And this is clearly one of them, that we, we are the most influential voice in the room. We have put some money where our mouth is in terms of global health security. And we are, we are the most listened to voice at WHO, at the World Bank, at, in the G7. And let's use that power wisely. I mean, we can, we can bring others along with us if we're listening to them and propose things that are doable. And I, that's been my diplomatic experience, but the, in health, it's even more true. I think that the, the sense of where the US stands compared to its partners and how much we are recognized as the indispensable partner and leader there. And I, I am genuinely worried that we're losing that edge and that we're missing those opportunities uh, with the current posture. Sorry. You DOD people can. <laughs> Can you stand up also? I'm, um, I'm a old generation here. Could you, um, yeah, could you stand? Stephanie McKay. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. Um, Stephanie McKay. I'm an HHS and a health security enthusiast. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure I think it's speak to like, the role of the social sciences in health security. So just like we saw, I guess, in Ebola, how anthropology and sociology could also be incorporated and must be incorporated in the health security response, and not only how they can be incorporated with political science and public health, but also how they can be operationalized as well. Yeah. I mean, first, there are many institutions, and this is probably one of them, that actually look at medical anthropology and the role of social sciences and hard sciences as one. WHO, as part of their reforms, have now established when they set up these operation centers to, re to respond to emergencies, outbreaks, uh, epidemics, have a anthropologist seat at the table, how that's going to be filled or who, uh, what criteria they have, who knows. But that, I think that's a step in the right direction. And that absolutely was the key in Liberia, the, uh, West Africa, that the customary practices were the main vector for this, uh, for Ebola. Uh, on the other hand, I, think that, I don't think there, that you can have the grand ministry of social science in medicine or something like that. I, most of what global health does is pretty much done by health professionals. And, the sense that they have to second guess themselves all the time with uh, what does informed consent mean and how are we going to, um, what impact does this have, I think are important things to keep in mind but would absolutely paralyze us if we actually had to have committees that decided all this before we uh, intervened somewhere. So what you, what you say is right but I hope, you have, I hope you have an elegant solution of how that can be accomplished but I don't. I think, I think it's it's a state of mind, but it also is going to have to be solved ad hoc because each situation is different. Clearly, Zika is very, anthropology was also very important. I mean, the reason it didn't spread in the US is apparently because we have air conditioning and screen doors and they don't in Recife. And so, I mean, you can, that's an easy fact to establish, but the, sometimes the medical implications of this are lost on people who are responding. But the, it's, um, but at what the various levels at which you need the social science insight and the disparities in health, the inequities, the uh, social determinants of health are all there. But I think we as the US at least have had a horrible time dealing with those in a multilateral context and saying, well, what is, what is actually the world's policy toward all of this? And yes, poverty is correlated with poor health, but should we drop everything and try to end poverty or do we actually need some health responses that are dealing with people who are actually sick now, regardless of whether they're hurt or poor. So, sorry, I wish I had the answer. If you have it, though, stay <laughs> after. <laughs> and, and I think that that also brought us back to this question of the people that we're training and the technical professionals with an understanding of the global context mm -hmm. and how to act that you, with which you began today. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to, I we've come to the end of our hour, sure. I would like to thank you for this time and for carving time out of your, what should be your retirement, <laughs> to uh, come back and contribute to Georgetown and our community, to AAAS and through, I hope, through our organizations to, uh, to creating a much stronger core of global health diplomats for the future. So thank you so much for today and for all of the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.